Okay, so let me let me get this on the video. So this is the pro proposed exam. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, No. Well, so I'm just about to say something about that that I was talking to people about. That's right. So the final is going to have non-inertial and, and then old stuff. Yep, that's right. 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 Yep, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yep. Okay. So here's the here's the proposal I'm making. So uh on this Thursday, uh, was that the 31st, I think? OK, so uh, there would be um, a couple of questions, maybe three questions on rigid body kinetics. And there would be three questions or two questions on linkages. How you do on the rigid body kinetics questions will replace or be your exam three score. How you do on the linkages ones will be your exam four score. Yep, and the quiz will be just on linkages. Um, if you don't like this idea, um, send me an email right after class. I'll keep it anonymous, so just let me know if, if you don't like this idea. Um, and so then later this afternoon, I'll tell you what the, what the deal is. And I'll also, I'm also going to give you a, a new set of rigid body kinetics uh, practice problems. Um, they're going to be focused more on kind of the simple stripped down rigid body kinetics where there's not as much uh, not as much time spent on geometry, not as much time spent on moments of inertia, you know, just to make sure that so I just want this to be about like just understanding the principles of rigid body kinetics so you can move on to understanding linkages. Um, All right, so now let's go on to linkages. And linkages are like the dynamic version of structures. Um, so structures are static collections of rigid bodies.
Linkages are dynamic collections of rigid bodies. Um, so some examples of linkages would be uh, I think there was a statics problem about a system like this. where you have pin joints connecting all these pieces. And when you apply some force here, you want to know, you know, and maybe there's some other force R here. You want to know what the acceleration of all of these pieces are. <coughs> okay. Uh, another type, uh, this is a really common type, um, is a four bar linkage. Um, so say that you have pins here, pins connecting it to the ground. Um, anyone notice anything odd about this four bar linkage? <laughs> yeah, it only has three bars. But the ground is a bar. So um, like you could imagine, you could put a bar there. It wouldn't do anything. But, uh, but now it has four bars. So, but the idea of any four bar linkage is as you move it through its uh, range of motion, a point on this bar moves through some prescribed path. And it's not, a, it's not a line, it's some kind of curve. And what the curve is depends on the relative lengths of these members. And so it's a way to, um, it's a way to prescribe you know, a complicated motion of something here that you know, obviously could be a, you know, connected to some other part of a machine or something. And so this is used in mechanics a lot. Um, and in fact, the, the knee joint is um, essentially works like a four bar linkage. Um, your knee, as you bend your leg, it's not just like a pin joint. It does this, uh, it does this pretty complicated motion that has to do with your cruciate ligaments and your collateral ligaments and you know, your patella is connected to tendons. The motion that your tibia does when you bend your knee is pretty complicated. But those ligaments lock it in place, and it sort of acts like a four-bar linkage. So there are a few examples uh, of, of how that's used. Um, and so I just want to give a set of steps for solving these, and then we'll go through a couple example problems. Uh, I guess before I go through the set of steps, I want to um, give a refresher on joints. We, we talked about, so this is basically the same thing I said about joints and statics. Um, but obviously when you have linkages, these members have to be connected by joints. Um, so here's sort of a summary of 2D joints. Um, so joints are attachments between bodies. And um, each joint is defined by the type of load or the type of loads it applies to each connected body. So I'm going to go in order um, from the joints that apply a single load variable to the members. Then I'm going to talk about the ones that apply two load variables, then three. Um, OK, so 
the first type there are uh, three of these apply a force with a known direction to each attached body so how many variables are there if you have a say you have an unknown force but you know the direction how many variables does that bring up yep so this introduces one variable into your equations the first one is a pin in slot so if this member has a pin through it and that pin is allowed to slide in a slot that's part of a second member. So what's happening here is this member on the left can slide up or down along this slot as that pin slides. This member can also rotate. Um, that pin doesn't keep it from rotating. Uh, and so free body diagrams of these two members This member is going to have a force. What's the direction of that force? Yep, it's going to be perpendicular to the slot. So this force is perpendicular to the slot. And we represent it with a single variable. So you could call it R or F or whatever. Um, that's just a scalar variable. It's not a force vector. It doesn't have two unknown components. Um, how do I know that this force, so there's two directions perpendicular to this slot. How do I know that we want the one going to the left instead of to the right? You don't. But fortunately, you know, when you solve this, you'll get either a pos like say you'll get positive 1,100 or negative 1,100. And if it's a negative 1100, that means the actual force is in the opposite direction, but you can still use that perfectly well. So you just arbitrarily choose one of the two directions and it does the rest. So what would happen if like, this was in the context of the slot? Um, yeah, then, uh, then that wouldn't be a good model of it. So, I mean, at that point, if it was, if it was forced up to the top, then it would be like a pin joint. You know, and probably what that means is in designing your linkage, you'd want a different kind of joint there. That isn't that isn't what works there, or a longer slot, I suppose. But um, and so for the other member, what's the direction of the force applied to this member? Opposite. And do we know anything about the magnitude? It's equal to this, so this has to be R also. The second type of joint is a frictionless contact. So in this case, a free body diagram of the member in contact with the ground there. So there's the bottom of the member. What's the direction of the force? OK, yep. And do we know which perpendicular direction this is? 
In this case, we do because the ground can't pull on the member. So this has to be like a normal force um, toward the chosen body, away from the contacting body. So the force in this case is like this. I'll write that as N. So that's perpendicular to the surface. Um, away from the contacting body. And again, that n is a scalar variable, so that just brings up one variable into the equations. And then the last type is a roller joint. You can represent that two ways. They both mean the same thing. So one is like this. And equivalently, you could draw it. Um, so a lot of times, people draw these as like a little roller skate. But those mean the same thing. And if you draw a free body diagram of this member, um, again, it's a single variable. Do we know the direction of that force? Yeah, it has to be perpendicular to that surface. And what about, is it, does it, do we know the direction or do we just know it down to two possibilities? Again, this is a normal force. Um, all it can do is push. And so we have a force that's perpendicular to the surface away from the contacting body. Okay, so that's the three types that bring up one variable into the equations. Um, the next three, uh, no, next two. So the next two joints, joint types, um, apply an unknown force vector to the contacting bodies. It's different from the first three because we don't know the direction. So this brings up two variables. Uh, the first one is a pin joint. This is going to be the most common one in the linkages. So that looks like this. In a free body diagram, uh, and you know, actually change this. So the way it's going to come up most of the time in linkages is you're going to have a connection between two bodies that, you know, both of which you're going to do free body diagrams for. So it'll look something like that. Um, the free body diagram for this top member looks something like this. It's the force. So if this is body one and this is body two, in the subscript notation, what do we call this force? The force on one by two. And the free body diagram for the other one what do we call this one? Yeah, so this is F on two by one or negative F one two by Newton's third law. And then the second type is a contact with friction.
and a free body diagram. Again, it's an unknown force vector. We don't know anything about the direction, so you just write this as, you know, the force on body one by the ground in this case, if this is body one. And then the last type is a fixed joint. So the last type introduces an unknown force vector. and an unknown couple into your equations. Um, this requires three variables. That's a fixed joint. So that's talking about something that's glued or welded or, you know, it, there's no freedom of movement between these two bodies. Um, and so if you have a beam here that's cantilevered to the wall, um, a free body diagram of the beam has an unknown force vector. So I'll call that the force on one by the wall if this is body one, and a couple, M. You could also call this couple the force on one by the wall. Um, since couples are really made up of two forces, you could prove to yourself that um, the couple on the wall by member one has to be equal and opposite to this. So Newton's third law works with couples too. Um, any questions about the joints? So in statics, we did a lot with these. Um, so now, let me give you a general method for linkages, and then we'll spend the rest of the time doing examples. Um, so, number each body in the linkage, um, and now for each member in the linkage, these are the set of steps. First, draw free body diagrams and find the Newton's law equation, so Newton's second law and the rotational Newton's second law for the member that you're on. Uh, the things to consider about this. Um, now, each member that you do this for is a rigid body, and so you're going to go through the steps of solving a rigid body, rigid body kinetics. Um, if the member has a fixed point, So examples of members that have fixed points are um, like a member that's connected by a pin joint to the ground 
or a member that's connected by a frictionless con by a friction contact to the ground or a member that's connected by a fixed joint to the ground okay in any case all of those the point that's in contact between the member and the ground there's no motion between those okay and so in that case you know that your about point can be that fixed point so um, if the member has a fixed point, your about point is the fixed point. In this case, so if you think back to rigid bodies, uh, in this case, do you have to use Newton's second law or do you not have to? Remember, there was, you don't have to, that's right. So um, A is your fixed point. No need for Newton's second law. And so uh, in 2D, basically all these problems are going to be in 2D. Uh, but in 2D, you're going to get then one useful equation from this member. That comes from the rotational equation. In 3D, how many useful equations will you get? Three, that's right. But still, all of those just come from the rotational equation. On the other hand, uh, if there's no fixed point, in your inertial coordinate system, then the about point is equal to the center of mass. Um, then you do need Newton's second law. And so in 2D problems, how many equations do you get? Yeah, two from Newton's second law, one from the rotational equation. So Newton's second law and rotational. And in 3D, how many do you get? Six, yep. Three from Newton's second law and three from the rotational. Um, after you come up with the equations, Make sure that you've used Newton's third law wherever it's possible to get the minimum number of equations. Uh, make sure you've used Newton's third law wherever possible to uh, minimize, I think I said equations, but minimize the number of variables. And then third, um, list out your equations and list out your variables. So you can see this is pretty similar to the method for structures and statics. Um, now, When you're done with each member, go on to the next step. Step four, uh, count the total number of equations and the total number of variables. In order to solve it, you need the same number of both. Um, so, 
you know, subtract and you can see how many more equations you need. And once you know how many equations you need, um, you get those equations from constraints. Um, most of the time, the joints are pin joints. Um, so at pin joints, here's the type of constraint that you use. Um, you can basically think of it as um, the acceleration of the pin according to one member must equal the acceleration of the pin according to the other member. Um, so uh, you're going to use relative motion, and you're going to use the watermelon equation. The acceleration is equal to alpha cross r plus omega cross quantity omega cross r. That's not a negative sign. Um, at other joints, you just have to think about um, what component of acceleration Um, are disallowed. For example, at a roller, the component of acceleration that's perpendicular to the surface has to be zero. So in some of these, you just have to think physically about what, you know, what kind of motions are allowed. Um, if something is, so like if something's rolling along the tabletop, it can't accelerate up off of the table or into the table. It's just going to roll this way. Okay. So that's one of the constraints that you'll use. Any questions about that method? Okay, so here's an example problem. So let's say there's a pin joint here connecting to a bar and another pin joint connecting to another bar. Um, call this one member one and this one member two. And let's say that each of them has a length of one meter. And each of them has a mass of 10 kilograms. And let's also say that there's some external couple, like, you know, maybe this is connected to a motor or something that's applying a couple to this. Um, on member one, of 5,000 newton meters. At the instant shown, uh, 
omega for member one is the same as omega for member two. They're both zero. And let's say we want to calculate alpha for each member. Okay, well I'm going to put my coordinate system up here. So first I'm going to isolate member 1. And you can even, you know, think about going through the steps for rigid bodies. So for member 1, the steps for solving rigid bodies say first does it have a fixed point or not? Member 1 does uh, the point up at the top is fixed in the ground system. So, what? Oh, yeah, so that even though the, the body isn't fixed, that pin is fixed. Yep, right. So, the about point is, well, let's label these. Uh, let's call this A and B. So the about point is B. And so we know we're not going to need Newton's second law, just the rotational equation. So now go to the free body diagram. What do we have acting on this body? Yeah, at the pin we have a force vector. Um, so I'll call that the force on one by the ground. We have the externally applied couple, 5,000 Newton meters. We have the weight. It has a mass of 10 kilograms, so that's 98.1. And one more load. Yeah, force on one by two. This is member one. And you could write out the table. This is one where I think Probably most of you don't need the table to calculate these, and it's fine with me if you don't use it. But you always can use it for any rigid body. So P A rho F M. Um, so first we have the force vector F one G. That's at the origin. What's our about point for this member? That's the origin. And unlike statics, you know, we don't get choices about where these go. Um, they're either at the center of mass for something without a fixed point or at the fixed point for something that does have one. So the row vector is zero. The force vector is F1GX, F1GY. So there's no moment. Uh, then we have the couple of 5,000. None of this stuff matters for a couple. Then we have the weight force. Uh, what's the location where the weight force is applied? Yeah, 0, negative 0.5. So the row vector is 0, negative 0.5. 
the force vector is 0, negative 98.1. And so there's no moment. And then the last one is F12. What are the coordinates where that's applied? Zero. Yep, 0, negative 1. So the row vector is 0, negative 1. The force vector is F12x, F12y. And so the moment is a positive F12x. And I'm, this is sort of a shorthand. Really, these are all vectors. Um, and what I'm showing here is the z component. So Newton's second law, oh, we don't need Newton's second law because this one has a fixed point. So no Newton's second law for this one. The rotational equation, I guess I forgot to calculate the moment of inertia. We need that. Um, so the moment of inertia of this member about D or about the about point what yeah that's right so this is going to be um, 1 12th times the mass times the length squared and then use the parallel axis theorem so plus the mass times the distance from the center of mass to our desired point. What's that distance? Yeah, so 0.5 squared. And so you get uh, 0.833 for this part. The parallel axis theorem part is uh, 2.5. So you get 3.33 kilogram meters squared. Question? So the rotational equation says 5,000 plus F12x is equal to 3.33 times alpha of member 1. So put this in the form that we're used to. Uh, we get the first equation that says F12x minus 3.33 alpha 1 is equal to negative 5,000. Okay, so we have one equation, and how many variables do we have? Yeah, so this is a place where it's not too uh, it's not too hard to get confused. I've introduced a bunch of variables: um, f one g x, f one g y, f one two x, f one two y. But as long as they don't come up in the final set of equations, they don't matter to us. Okay, so. I introduced three variables in the table that we don't care about. The only ones we care about so far are F12x and alpha1. OK, so we have one equation, two variables. And now we can go on to body two. 
Any questions about the first body? Yep. Um, so I was just wondering, like, do you mean which structure? Do you do a Schematic diagram of the whole structure before you do uh, Yeah, that doesn't help here. Um, and the reason that doesn't help is I think, I can't remember why. I think it had something to do with the fact that um, coming up with, OK, so yeah, basically thinking of something as having a moment of inertia or having angular velocities or angular accelerations um, require treating it as a rigid body. And when you isolate the whole thing, these pieces are moving relative to each other. And so that just doesn't even make any sense, really. OK. So yeah, that's a difference between this and structures, is you're not going to isolate the whole thing. And it's because the whole thing isn't a rigid body. Only the pieces are rigid bodies. So moving forward, do you have to keep our origin where it is? You don't have to, but might as well, I don't think. It makes anything, you know, you can move it if you want. The only thing you have to do is just like statics, you have to keep the orientation the same. Now, does having, I mean, we changed now that this one really doesn't work out. But That's right. Those, those two sets of equations go. Yeah, think of it like this. They're both, we're just trying to come up with as many true equations as we can about the set of variables that we have. So we have an equation here that's true. Now we're going to go on and find a new set of equations that are true. It doesn't matter whether, you know, we don't care about about points and stuff. We just care about listing everything we know, kind of. Because now we don't get to choose the about points. It's only the center. That's right. Yeah. Yep. So now we have the center of mass for, for body two. How would you get the angular Well, you could do it, but notice that in this case, so um, I guess I have two things to say about that. So the first one is notice that if we did use Newton's second law, there'd be a bunch of new variables that we don't have to worry about currently that we would have to. So that's not good. And then the benefit of doing Newton's second law comes from when you start using relative motion equations. Like um, based on body two, how would you represent the acceleration of this point at A? You know, you'd have to use relative motion and say it's the acceleration of the center of mass plus the acceleration of this relative to the center of mass. Um, but we don't have to do that if there's a fixed point because this is already fixed. You know, so we don't we don't have to use relative motion at that point. Okay, does that sort of help? Um, any other questions? All right, so now body two. Does this have a fixed point? No fixed point. So the about point is the center of mass of body two. Um, and so I guess right now let's calculate the moment of inertia. Uh, so the moment of inertia about the center of mass of body two is 1 12th times 10 times the length squared which is 0.833 kilogram meters squared. And now the free body diagram. What forces are acting? What loads? We have the force on two by one. And that's equal to negative F12. Uh, 
Uh, what about that couple? Does that show up here? Nope. That's only acting on member one. There's a weight force um, of 98.1. And anything else? That's it. So write out the table. I'm going to use the same coordinate system, but if you wanted to move the origin for the new body, you could. Um, so what are the coordinates of the point where negative F12 is acting? Yep, 0, negative 1. And what's the about point? The center of mass. So in this case, if the origin is still way up here, this is going to be 0, negative 1.5. Subtract and you get 0, positive 0.5 for the row vector. The force vector is negative F12x, negative F12y. And so the moment is 0.5 F12x. And then the weight force, that's at 0, negative 1.5. So you can see that the row vector is going to be 0. The force vector is 0, negative 98.1. Cross that with the 0 vector, and you get 0 for the moment. On this one, do we have to use Newton's second law? Yes. So Newton's second law says negative F12x, negative F12y plus 0, negative 98.1 is equal to the mass, 10, times the acceleration. Do we... Do, uh, of the center of mass, that's right. Right now, do we know anything about the acceleration of the center of mass? That's right. Let's say we don't. So I'm giving this a lot of subscripts. but So acceleration of the center of mass of two x and y components. And then the rotational equation says 0.5 F12x is equal to the moment of inertia, 0.833 times the angular acceleration of body 2. OK, so we have our second equation says negative F12x is equal to, well, let me write it in the different form. So uh, negative F12x minus 10A COM2 X component is equal to 0. Equation 3 says negative F12y minus 10A center of mass 2y component is equal to 98.1. And the fourth equation says 0.5 F12x minus 0.8 3, 3, alpha 2 is equal to 0.
because uh, that's over on the left side of this equation, and then I added 98.1. Okay, so I have four equations, and the variables um, from before we just had f12x and alpha1. Now we also have f12y. So f12x, f12y, alpha1 from body 1, and our new equations also give us acceleration of center of mass to x component and y component. And it also gives us alpha 2. So we have four equations, one, two, three, four, five, six variables. So how many constraint equations do we need? Yep. Okay, so let's take a 10 minute break, come back and we'll go through the constraint equations and then hopefully work on another problem too.